This itching sensation is not merely a discomfort, but may indicate deeper underlying issues. Overproduction of sebum, driven by excessive DHT, can irritate the scalp's sebaceous glands, causing for this itch to happen. There's a scalp condition called seborrheic dermatitis that has been observed as a byproduct due to DHT and overactive sebaceous the glands. The dermatitis presents as scaly, sometimes oily, inflamed skin that can be itchy or even painful to touch. This is an inflammatory condition the cause of which is not well understood, although there does seem to be a genetic component in Caucasian, particularly of Celtic descent, are most susceptible. It seems that the sebaceous glands attached to the hair follicles begin to produce a very rich form of sebum. The sebum contains fewer free fatty acids and squalene but increased triglycerides and cholesterol. In part, the trigger for may be androgen steroids. Times of hormone fluctuation, such as during puberty, can activate the onset of seborrheic dermatitis. And there's actually an interesting study that talks about this entire process. The study titled, quote, The Annual Changes of Clinical Manifestations of Androgenetic Alopecia Clinic in Korean Males and Females, an Outpatient-Based Study, end quote, by Wu Sung Jang et al., published in 2013, involved a total of 833 male patients, 385 female patients, culminating in an overall count of 1,218 patients from both genders. Subarheic dermatitis was identified as the most frequent associated disease in both male and female patients with androgenetic alopecia. Interestingly, the prevalence of seborrheic dermatitis in androgenetic alopecia was notably higher compared to the prevalence in the general population, which ranges from 1 to 3%. The connection between androgenetic alopecia and seborrheic dermatitis, while evident, has not been definitively established. The authors of this study make the point that it is known within the scientific literature that seborrheic dermatitis is related to the elevated production of DHT in affected areas. And they actually go on to reference an article from an academic paper titled Androgenetic Alopecia in Adolescents, a report of 43 cases, where it is even further established that there is some sort of connection and correlation between psoriatic dermatitis and androgenetic alopecia, as well as acne. So you have all these other conditions coming together because of DHT. This hormone, DHT, plays a crucial role in activating sebaceous glands, which is a significant factor in both seborrheic dermatitis and androgenetic alopecia. And also, I forgot to add, acne. So I don't think people are crazy when they suggest that they're having an itch due to DHT. Now, I think in some cases, some people tend to overblow it. It could just be that you're, you know, having an itchy scalp due to other reasons. But it is conceivable that heightened levels of DHT may lead to overactive sebaceous glands, which leads to clogged pores and inflammation. And if that happens on your face, you get acne or acne vulgaris. Or if that happens on your scalp, you can get seborrheic dermatitis. So is it any wonder why all these androgenetic alopecia treatments, these topical anti-androgens, also have been researched to attempt to ameliorate acne? Well, let's look at some topical anti-androgens, which are at the moment largely experimental, with the first one actually being approved, FDA approved, for the treatment of acne, but it's yet to be FDA approved for androgenetic alopecia. And this particular topical anti-androgen is CB03 or 03. <laughs> Let's redo that. CB0301, also known as clascoterone. Clascoterone, distinct from treatments that target DHT directly, competes with the androgens like DHT by binding with a high affinity to androgen receptors. By blocking androgen receptor signaling pathways associated with acne, Clascoterone offers a targeted treatment approach. Like I said before, it has received FDA approval for acne under the name Winlevy. And currently, it's in clinical trial for its potential in treating androgenetic alopecia. And the company that's actually doing this clinical trial is Cosmo Pharmaceuticals. If all goes well, and it looks like they're in phase 3 in their clinical trial, 
class Cotterone CB0301 will be on the market by the brand name Brizula. And I think this can be as early as late 2024. Up next, we have KX826, also known as pyrolutamide, developed by Kintor Pharmaceuticals. Pyrolutamide functions as an androgen receptor agonist. It competes with endogenous androgens like DHT for binding to the sites on androgen receptors, neutralizing their adverse effects, kind of like clascoterone. Pyrolutamide has shown some promise in modulating sebum excretion rate and also with hair growth by blocking the androgen receptor, like I mentioned before. So again, as you can see, we have another topical anti-androgen treatment currently in research that is also being used in acne and male pattern baldness. And now finally, the most, I guess you can say, shady one of them all, the one that doesn't have published human clinical trials, although they have been performed, this is RU58841. Now, this non-steroidal anti-androgen works in many ways like the other topical anti-androgens like I described. It attaches to the androgen receptor and it blocks all androgens, not only DHT, but DHT is the only androgen we really care about when it comes to male pattern baldness because it has a high potency effect on the androgen receptor. So we have two particular studies of interest, research by Bateman et al, 1994, and Bernard et al, 1995, highlights its potential in addressing androgenetic dependent skin conditions, encompassing acne, androgenetic alopecia, and hirsutism. RU58841 exhibits a robust affinity for the androgen receptors. When encapsulated into liposomes, percutaneous or essentially going through the skin, its absorption is reduced compared to its solution form, ensuring a prolonged presence in the epidermis and dermis. So pretty much when we put RU58841 into liposomes, it's able to go through the skin and pretty much it hangs around in the scalp, not going fully systemic, which would, <laughs> it would have issues when it goes into the bloodstream. But yeah, those are just some things I wanted to share with you guys. So anyone who talks about a DHT itch from here on out, you're not going crazy. Try to not scratch too much and do any damage or pull out your hair. The inflammation process is, you know, I haven't necessarily had it before. I, I mean, I've, everyone has had an itchy scalp before, but at least how it's described by some people, it's like really, really itchy. I did a long time ago, but this pretty much related to a particular hairspray that I was using when I was about 15, had an awful allergic reaction that was super, super itchy. It was like inflamed and hot. Now, I didn't have any hair fall from, from that, but if that's how a DHT itch feels like, I feel for some of you guys. Hopefully, I don't get to experience that. But yeah, anyway, that's the end of this video.